Welcome to today's podcast interview. I brought on Becca Williams. Becca, welcome. Thank you, Heather. It's great to be here. I'm excited for today's topic. Before we get started, please give listeners a little background. Where do you live and what do you do? Yeah, so I I live in Portugal and I'm an American and um, my partner and I moved here um, not quite two years ago. And I had lived in Florida prior to that. And I also lived where where you're living now, and that is in Denver, Colorado. Um, yeah, I've been around. <laughs> and and, and what, uh, I, go ahead. And I am uh, uh, I am an emotions therapist. I'm trained as a clinical nutritionist, uh, but uh, as a clinician, but I I, I work uh, with emotions. That's my specialty. I help. Um, stressed and stuck and traumatized individuals process and release self-defeating emotions and the pain that goes with it so they can effectively and gracefully handle any personal or interpersonal situation. Essentially, I support people in becoming emotionally resilient. And that's why I wanted to have you on because I feel like this topic isn't talked about enough. For example, you were trained as a nutritionist. Is that that's what you said, right? Correct. So for mm-hmm. example, I feel like the health and wellness industry is so focused, so surface level focused on the body. But if we don't deal with the mind, the mental and emotional body, we're unhealthy. Oh, and so well said. Yeah. Stress mm-hmm. is the number one cause for all dis-ease in our bodies and in people. But most people are living in high stress survival mode. So how can we help them I mean, it's about calming our nervous system, right? Learning how to self-regulate. Can you please define what that even means? Mm -hmm. So I I, I just want to circle back to what you said in regard to nutrition and my work as a nutritionist. And we are so focused on the physicality, um, the, the, the body. And, you know... Uh, I, I used to I used to think, well, everything just anything that's wrong with you, essentially nutritional supplementation will uh, will help you will get get you out of it. And um, I realized that that was not the case. It certainly, you know, if your body is your temple, then it's nice to have a, a nice, clean, functioning temple. Um, but if you um, if you have a lot of trauma, and that's that's where I do the work, is that what we know is that trauma resides in our bodies. It resides in the tissues of our body and our nervous system. And these emotions that we feel are tethered to trauma. Um, and we work with uh, seven, in, in my work, uh, uh, emotional liberation, we work with seven difficult emotions or families of, and they are ang- anxiety. So fear and anxiety is one family of, uh, of, of emotions. And that is fear and anxiety, but it can be low level, like, like being nervous, uh, fear, anxiety, panic, terror. They are all in the fear family. And then we have depression, uh, anger, um, sadness and grief. We have what we call the mother of all emotions. And that is, doesn't even sound like an emotion, but it's desire or uh, what we want. We want something, anything, anything we need, first and foremost, we need to have a desire for it. So if I say, I want to I want to use this pen and pick up this pen. That's my desire. If I want a a, a loving, uh, mutually respectful relationship, that's a desire. And usually it's born out of neediness. And so, you know, being needy all the time. And then the other two are a guilt and then shame, which we most uh, usually refer to as self-doubt. And that's where the sense of uh, unworthiness comes or that I'm not deserving kind of things. So we work with these uh, seven difficult emotions and they can be very close uh, to the surface, Heather. And that's why we I wanna go back to the, the nervous system regulation. And that is uh, the work that we do in emotional liberation. Everything we do is to settle the uh, the nervous system down because when you have um, 
when you have a hyper aroused nervous system, you can't do any work. You're on edge. You can't do deep, uh, deep work. So a, a, a big uh, facet of what we do is really recalibrating the nervous system. And we do that through, um, uh, through, Mm, uh, what do I want to say? Through ancient teachings, we reach back to yogic science and we draw on a particular kind of yoga, and that is called Kundalini. It's 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 es it's more esoteric than the others, but what it does is it is a very ambitious form of movement and uh, and and breath work that actually stirs up these emotions so that we can process them to release them, and it's all done when we can uh, when we can settle our nervous system down. I just think this is so timely and I love life's synchronicity. So this morning I was listening to an interview with Greg Braden and he was, he does a lot of work with the heart math Institute and him and Dispenza all talk about creating brain and heart coherence that we're mm -hmm. so stuck in our head and we're so disconnected from our heart and our body. That's what creates so much chaos and his, as an example. So I know Kund would you say that the Kundalini yoga is more like, a high level or advanced form of regulation? I would say that it is a structured form of movement and breath yeah. that is, uh, what do I want to say? Um, it's codified so that we're not chancing anything. So if you want to describe it as a higher level, I would say that it's very formalized. It's a very intentional yeah. practice. I did it in Costa Rica at this retreat oh. I went to, but um, with the Greg Braden piece to bring that back in. So what he teaches, even through like a three minute, again, these are very intentional practices, but through a three minute breath work technique mm -hmm. that, so I think this is more or less creating what I call power of the pause. So can we talk about when we're triggered, when we're in this emotional turmoil, when there's a lot of chaos what is one thing we can do to come back to the present moment to calm our inner state so we can respond, not react? Yeah. And, you know, it's a good it's a good point because it's like, well, what can I do right here, right now? And I think it is a matter in the end of learning. So it's a skill of learning how to uh, uh, surf the waves of uncertainty with grace and perseverance. And that's not just a one-off. It's, it's a practice and it needs to be learned. That's why I teach this work yeah. that uh, when someone does a practice one-off and you probably experienced this in Costa Rica, you felt great afterwards. You, you know, you were walking on clouds, yeah. but what happens that that actually gets everything going and moving, but then, you know, uh, a few hours later or a day later or whatever, the, it, we just go right back to those, those neural networks of anxiety or, you know, and fear or depression or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep doing the work. It is, there's a whole, uh, um, what do I want to say, a framework for this that includes a lot of things going on in order to start, and, and I know Dispenza uh, is very much about this, is, is changing your neural network your neural networks. And so he has actual images of where you see old neural networks dissolving and new ones being created. And that's what we do. I can only talk from my perspective. So I want to hear more from you, but I, I want to help people understand like what are the symptoms of trapped emotions? Um, and so, for example, a lot of what Dispenza teaches is like when we're talking about our chakras or energy centers, a lot of people, if you pay attention, have gut issues. A lot of people have reproductive issues. And those are the first couple centers, which are our creation. But when we're stuck in survival, that's why we have bodily malfunctions because it's trapped emotions, right? Trapped emotions, right. Trapped so it, now, you know, we're looking at different paradigms. I mean, I could compare and contrast Greg Brayton or Joe's uh, 
paradigms with with mine, and they're all slightly slightly different. But uh, yes, you know, uh, when we look at the chakras, so the 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 solar plex, which is you know that right there, right above the navel, that's a very important one for our power, and in the emotional. Uh, structure that we use in emotional liberation, it is very equated to anger. So, um, so what happened when we were growing up, a lot of the time, we didn't learn how to be angry. In fact, a lot of us were told, shut up and sit down. If you're not going to say something nice, don't say anything at all. So our anger, we had to put a lid on our anger. We, we weren't able to express. And so here we are, fast forward to adulthood, and we don't know how to get angry. We don't know how to express ourselves. And it's either expressed with mostly what we know, um, with anger is expressed. So it's like, and I did this too, was, uh, this, 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 the nuclear reaction, right? It just expressed this toxic anger all over everything, or there's repressed yeah. anger where we hold it in. A lot of times we were told, you know, this, this, this is for people who were told never to get angry. And so you had to stuff it, right? You're stuffing it. And so it's kind of the moaning and groaning and just every, you know, everything's not quite right. And, 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 and as opposed to the express, those are both forms of anger and what we want and, and power. So you can say in my work, I teach that power equals anger. And so how are we going to express our anger? And we learn to do this by virtue of, 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 of working with the solar plexus, because that's where that power, that anger, that trauma uh, is uh, often located there. So we do a lot of work. Um, these, uh, these practices that we do are correlated to the various emotions. So for anger, there's a lot of strong practices that we do to, again, stir that up so that we can process it and release it. Yeah. Here's what else is coming to mind. And what I shared with you, I especially, I have so much compassion for men because think about men, especially in the Western society are taught, you know, big boys don't cry. So they are taught from a very young age to not express. It's weak. It's vulnerable. An old paradigm, men couldn't be weak or vulnerable or emotional. They would die in war, right? So like, like there is deep conditioning, but what, what I kind of notice, and I, I try to make light of it. But as an example, one of my clients in his mid fifties, um, until he has become self-aware and dealing with why his relationships never last, it's literally like, you know, a seven-year-old boy with emotional intelligence is trying to run his relationships as a 50 something. Right. And, and me most people are walking around with lacking emotional intelligence and wonder why relationships and everything doesn't work. And, and that's why we need to go back and clear out that backlog because that is so right. We see it over and over again that we, we incurred trauma at six years old, something awful that just embedded itself, that, that, uh, that emotionality embedded itself. And so here we are at 50 years old and something comes out of left field. Uh, somebody says something, somebody does something. I say an errant thought triggered it. And we go back to that six-year-old and that's how we act. So we are stuck there. We are stuck. And so this work that I, I do, the emotional liberation, is actually going back as well and, and tapping in to that old stuff so that we can we can let it go so that we can reset ourselves and we are clear so that we can go forward with a, a, a clear vision. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm so visual. So I'm imagining right now. So all of us, we, we have a body and these traumas and experience that have happened. If we did suppress the emotions, we literally have all these um, like Tetris blocks in our body, right? So Please, let's first explain, if we don't deal with our emotions, if we don't become self-aware, if we don't learn how to regulate and healthily express, what happens? Well, first of all, we're miserable, right? Yeah. yeah. And we go through life miserable. Yeah. 
Um, and, and, you know, a lot of it has to de uh, depends on whether these emotions are expressed or repressed. And I would suggest that the repressors have, uh, they hold it in, where does it have to go? And it goes into physical maladies right? Physical dis-ease. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that people who are just really angry and are, ex and are expressive about it uh, aren't going to get sick, but particularly holding this stuff in is, um, is really detrimental. It's, it's, all, it, it's all detrimental because you know what? We blow up our relationships, not only our lives, but we blow up our relationships. And so we can't maintain... Um, interpersonal communications because we don't know how to do it well. We've never been taught or we've never been able to get out of our own way. And consequently, a lot of people are in a very lonely space because they don't know how to navigate um, human relationships. Well, it's like a self-imprisonment, right? And I saw a oh. quote last week that um, your relationships are a reflection of the relationship you have with yourself. Yes. So if Truly. you have a, what I understand is if we have a toxic internal environment, we're holding on to anger and resentment and fear and doubt and unworthy. We try to project that onto others, which creates all the chaos in our life, right? And that's what creates toxic relationships, right? And so it's very important when we start doing this work and we are, are having these mm, learning through the self-knowledge dropping into our inner knowing, into our intuition. And we are uh, coming up with new ways to feel. Um, and we, we want to address our life differently. Well, that's a big deal, right? When we're, we're changing internally, but nothing out there has changed. So we have um, uh, we, we have had these uh, huge breakthroughs internally, but we go out there and we don't know how to deal with it. So very important is this integration piece uh, within emotional liberation, where we learn how to navigate out there, for instance, drawing good boundaries. The reason why uh, people uh, are angry a lot of the times and it's misplaced anger and it's badly managed anger is because they need to get their way and they have no other way. They know no other way to get their way than to yell and scream. And so when they learn that that's not the way that they need to navigate softly, they go out and they're very lonely. That's what happens when people start walking through the fire is that, and you, you know, you see a lot of this, uh, that they, that old relationships, friendships, you know, partnerships start, dr start dropping away. And there's this in between before people start getting new healthy relationships. My students, uh, one of my students coined it, and it's sort of a through line for the work we do. And they, she called it the um, the shaken snow globe. That in it early on when we're doing this work yeah. is that we are having these huge realizations, and then we go out there and we're like, whoa, what? And she, so she said it was, you know, it was like, hmm. You're, you know, you're, you, you hit your out, you hit that outside like this and it's, it just shakes you. It's a shaken snow globe and, and, and it's really important to map it. It's really important to understand it. And so I, I make a big deal out of this shaken snow globe that when you go out with these realizations, know that you're going to encounter, um, what do I want to say? You're going to encounter um, a tsunami of blowback. I want to share this with you as like a real world experience. Uh, one of the earliest personal development books I read was The Four Agreements. And mm. one of the agreements is don't take anything personally. And so just a couple months ago, I was introduced to somebody new. And this guy out of nowhere, this is a grown man, married, father of two. I'd say he's probably like 48 had a complete outburst in it. I mean, it was ugly and it came out of nowhere. And I, I mean, like I'm still on my own journey, but I had such self-awareness to be able to stand back and not react, 
but to take the time to respond and realize, oh my gosh, and come from a place of compassion that, wow, that guy has clearly been through and he's got former military and just this bottled up anger guy, volcanic eruption. But how can we, while we're on our own personal growth journey and, and we're self-liberating, still be able to handle other people's and hold space, but not absorb? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, it's, you know, there was um, uh, Vernon Howard, who was a spiritual teacher at the turn of the century. And he said, I, I love what he said. He said, you cannot stop destructive actions by others, but you can stop your own destructive reactions to them. Yeah. And so I think that that kind of says it all as in learning how to live your life uh, where you may never convince that person to change at all. Uh, and it's a, but you know, you didn't know him. I mean, you can walk away after that. It's his wife or, you know, it's his kids or whatever who can't walk away. Yeah. Um, and he may never have a realization or an awareness to heal himself or have a longing to heal himself. You know, what I say is, is people who come into my life who are drawn to me, uh, and my and my work is that they're ready for it. They are on an awakening path. Yeah. And as we know, uh, you know, we are always on our path. But I say that the work really starts when we are aware that we are on our our path. Yeah. And then that's where um, where the where the big changes and and accelerated progress and healing can happen when we're in awareness and we know how to do it. Okay, so now that's what I want to talk about. Let's shift into because clearly those that listen to this podcast are into personal growth and development, want the tools, Many people do feel stuck in their life and maybe they don't even realize why they're stuck in their finances or their relationships or their health because of these trapped emotions. So can we talk about, I don't know if, if, if there's a framework you can share or daily practices, what can we do to um, be present in the moment and feel it to heal it so we can liberate ourselves? I, you know, I love the feel it to heal it. Um, and we need to feel into these emotions. So our emotions are a bridge to our soul, if you would. Um, you know, um, uh, we, we can't heal with our brain. We can't heal from the cognitive. We have to heal from the intuitive. And so of course the big question is, well, how do we get into the intuitive? What do we, what do we do? And there's, you know, there's, there's many avenues that, that suggest that, but what I suggest in my work is we do it through the emotions. So um, when I start working uh, with a, with a group in my masterclass courses, um, I, I, I teach them how to feel their emotions and we want to practice that. We want to learn what we're feeling and then we want to do these practices so that we can bring them up. But somebody cannot do that if they're not aware of what they're feeling. So that is the front line. My work is through the emotions and the emotions being a bridge to our soul. And so when we can, um, when we can connect with anxiety, for instance, and be with it and travel into it, we can find out why we're afraid, you know, because fear and anxiety, panic and terror are about, we, we fear for our lives in one way or another, bodily, physically, um, emotionally, whatever that might be. And so then we're able to to pull the thread and find out why it's there, why it's talking to us, because our difficult emotions are our friends. They are our allies. And this is something we've never known before. I mean, we're, I'm hearing now 10 years ago, nobody talked about this really, but in the last, you know, two or three years, it was about, well, you got to feel your emotions. Well, and it's very undefined. 
So how do I feel my emotions? What do I do? So that's what I teach is how to do that, how to go into it. And um, that's, that's the front line in this work is moving in to that, that deep place of inner knowing through your emotions. And, you know, meditation, there's a lot of different forms of meditation out there. And it's always all about the meditation, right? But I know uh, from my own personal experience that I couldn't do mindfulness meditation. I pursued Buddhist meditation. I pursued uh, Kabbalah meditation, which is a, for a mystical form of Judaism. And then, you know, kind of freelance, the mindfulness meditation. And what happened was my pounding thoughts just wouldn't allow me to sit. And it makes sense. I mean, so many, I always do a um, an intake, a client intake with all of my students and all of my clients. And, um, and so often, so many of them said, I tried meditation, but I couldn't do it because of these pounding thoughts. Of course, you know, the conventional wisdom is, well, sit long enough and then the, then, then the pounding thoughts will simmer down. But that's, that's not the case. And so, you know, the idea of, 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 of being mindful about them and thinking visually about walking along a beach or in a forest or whatever, that can work for some people. But when, when in our, in our, uh, paradigm, what we do is we go to that juicy caramel flavored center of emotions. And we do these practices and I guide people into their emotions. So it's not about, it's not about thinking bright, light, positive feelings. It's yeah. about, because people come to me and they're upset, right? They're right. feeling really crappy for one reason or another. So let's go into it. So what we do through this work is actually go into that, bring it up, bring it all up. And, and, and people don't have any problem with it because it's so close, right? It's so close to them, these, these, these terrible feelings. And so when, in a group setting, when I invite people to do this, they are, it's right there. It's just, you know, the emotion comes up, the, the, the crying, the, the whimpering. The, I mean, I've had people who, who could only laugh because they were so cried out. But all of this stuff is coming up so that we can bring it up and release it. I love how you shared all of that. And so what was coming to mind is my own personal experience. So as an example, sitting through meditation, and I've done Dr. Joe Dispenza's week longs and AFUs. And I remember one of them, I was in so much frustration, anger, and impatience with myself. And so I wasn't able to sit there. It was so uncomfortable. And after the that guided meditation, I went to one of the meditation assists and I explained it and we named the emotions. And so what he calls, and I think you've already referred to it as you have to sit through the fire of discomfort because whatever you resist persists, right? And so mm -hmm. a lot of people just want to brush it under the rug or come back to it later. It's too uncomfortable. But the thing is what I've experienced when I can create the space and sit through the fire of discomfort. When it you acknowledge it, it dissolves and you release. And that is how you liberate yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, you continue doing that and you start forming new neural networks. It is a practice, but for those people, like it is, it's going to be uncomfortable at first, but also I, I'll share another way I've done it. I love running. I also love nature. Mm -hmm. I'm a big hiker. And so for me, running, because it creates so much presence and it's movement, I have felt like there's a thing called a runner's high, but I have felt freedom and liberated when I'm in that emotional turmoil and I go and I move and I breathe through it and I feel it. So I've done it running as well. What are some other modalities? If sitting still, I remember one client of mine, he's like, I feel like I'm crawling out of my skin. Mm hmm that's how we don't sit still. We don't sit still. Right. We have to move. Uh, okay. And I, I mean, a busy and distracted society out there where we're running, running, running and whatever it is. And then somebody says, OK, Heather, sit down and shut up and meditate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And 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 so I like the focus 
uh, of that's why I do the work I do is, you know, on my on my website, uh, I, uh, the, the headline is the search is over because so many people who feel so crappy have upturned so many stones looking for answers from talk therapy to, you know, uh, webinars of uh, new age webinars of this, that and the other thing or whatever. And nothing, nothing has helped. And I was there. I did that same thing. I was on that search. And, uh, and when I found this work, it was the end of the search and others, students agree with that, that there doesn't need to be anything more than learning to do this so that you can surf those waves of uncertainty. Mm. Can we talk more about this intuitive side? Because as I shared with you, some thing on social media I saw quite a while ago was the longest, um, what was the longest journey an individual will take is the 14 inches from their head to their heart. And we're so mm. disconnected from our internal guidance system, our GPS, everything we need is within. So through this practice, being more connected to self, what does that do for us? Mm -hmm. Well, so, so first of all, I, I, I teach uh, from ancient teachings and uh, and cutting edge science, Western science, um, that we we can't solve things with our mind, but we have been stuck in our mind all our lives. Unless you had really uh, healthy, uh, loving, educated parents around this stuff, where you know, if little Heather started crying, it's, well, darling, what, you know, you're upset. What are you upset about? Oh, and then being able to start, you know, having a parent who holds you and, 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 and explores with you what you're feeling. How many of us have that? None, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, not many from uh, from from my work and in, in seeing. I mean, I, I basically do remedial work for adults who have not been able to feel their emotions all their lives or don't know how to feel their emotions. So what I do is teach about the uh, about the emotions because the the brain wants to know. The brain wants to know what's going to be going on. The brain gets a seat at the table, but the brain is not. The mind is not at the head of the table. The heart, the intuition is at the head of the table. Mm -hmm. So we teach the, the mind about these, uh, about these emotions and the expectations around them. And then in another session, we go into the practices. And this is where the, uh, the plant medicine often comes up because it amplifies the emotion that we're, we want to work with. And it also amplifies the, mm, the, the rest and relax that we need. So we, we want to get out of the fight or flight um, you know, uh, syndrome, and we want to be in a relaxed state so that we can bring up these emotions and work with them. What are some of your daily practices or rituals? Well, I like to wake up. And I put three minutes on my timer and I just lie in bed and do some, uh, some, some expressive breath through the mouth. So it looks like this for three minutes and that's called cannon breath. And so that gets that, that, that just, that settles everything down actually. And, and, and brings, uh, brings in a, a new, what do I want to say? Um, uh, a new eagerness for life. And then I actually lay down and I count backwards from a hundred. And so that, that combination allows me just to get out of bed and, and, and move, you know, move into the rest of my day. Uh, so that little, you know, it's the tiniest of rituals that are so helpful. Um, now, during the course of the day, I will sit and I will meditate. Now, meditation in this work is very short. It's it's between eleven minutes and or and sixteen minutes, depending on the practice that you do. So it's not like a yoga tradition of where you do sadhana, which is you know the deep two hour stuff early in the morning. 
um, there are particular um, meditation and, and yogic traditions that do sadhana. Um, but I don't think it's necessary. Uh, from my experience, people need to put in the, 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 the time, the commitment. They need to come with the commitment. I don't want to say put in time because, you know, that's another box to check. But people need to be committed to this. They can't just be, just can't be, have a passing interest. Yeah. Just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do and I'll, I'll do it. Oh, you need to be invested yeah. and um in in committed to it so yeah. that 11 minutes is is really uh, an, an important time and again the uh the plant medicine uh, uh actually um what do i want to say stimulates or invigorates the passion for doing it i also want to share when i started I I mean, this was years ago because I was so addicted to go, go, go. I was addicted to stress. And I started with journaling and that moved into meditation. And I've always been a runner. But I just want to share at first, yes, it's uncomfortable because we're not used to to quieting our mind and creating that space. But I just want to share where I'm at now. I literally mm -hmm. crave it. I crave silence. Mm -hmm. Now, when I take my dog on our evening walks, I'm not listening to music or podcast. I'm yes. just in nature being. So I just I'm want so to share. I'm so glad to hear you. that. Yes. Yeah. I want to share. With I mean, how, how many, how many people are dog walking and you see them with, you know, with, with their, their, uh, their ears in <laughs> their, uh, their earbuds. My husband calls these ears. <laughs> yeah. the earbuds and listening to something right or people are on their bike or running with their earbuds in listening yeah. to something I, I agree with you wholeheartedly get it out of the way be present yeah. be present mm. but I literally now I crave the silence I I mean I mm. haven't been into tv and stuff for like years and even what I just I don't connect really with shows and movies so much anymore. But anyway, I just want to share that that is possible when you're on this journey and like the inner peace and, and what's possible. So here's what I want to ask you for mm. individuals who do feel stuck, who aren't happy, who are ready to do the work. How do they even get started? Mm -hmm. What's one thing to get started? Well, I, you know, I have to say that this is not just a, here's a tip and be on your way. Th this work is a, is a, a, a committed pursuit of doing this. I mean, I could give you, you know, what I like to suggest for people um, in, I'm all about relationships because we're social animals and everything we do out there is about relationship. So, <clears throat> excuse me. What I like to suggest are do-overs uh, between um, oh, more intimate relationships, whether that's your partner or good friends or even, even in a work atmosphere, but both people have to be on the same page and have to agree to do-overs. And this is what a do-over is. And I'll talk in terms of my husband. So, you know, you you spend so many hours together and somebody can be grumpy or say the wrong thing. And the other person that can be triggering to the other person. And then that person responds and then you're off to the races, right? And then you're in a bad place. Yeah. But if, if, if one or the other, uh, immediate, uh, uh, somebody says something, say my partner says something that feels yucky. I will say, Ooh, I want to do over on that. And so the partner who has agreed, right, we have a blanket agreement for a do over will say, OK, well, uh, let me see. How can I do that again? So you can see the awareness that's coming mm -hmm. up when you do that. Now, sometimes he might say something that's innocent enough and I might bark at him. I might bark at him and he may not bring it up, but like. 10 minutes later, I'll think, well, gee, that I was, I was not very nice in that. And I'll say, you know what? I think I want to do over on that. And, and so it, it really, it, it generates um, a wonderful warmth and respect yeah. between two people when they can do that. And it also allows you, encourages you to rethink what you said and why, why did I say that mean thing? So uh, yeah, that's a that's a that's a piece that I would um, that I would invite people 
to uh, to play with, to experiment with. And remember that when you do it, you need the other person in the equation to agree to do it. I love that because it, it's a pattern interrupt. It's an awareness piece and it gives you a chance to redo. Yes. Which, you know what that brings up? I love this. Um, you know, the saying, you've made your bed, you have to lie in it. Yes. I think it's a very unhealthy, but people believe that. And so I think even this idea of a do-over, every moment is a chance for a do-over. You do not have to lie in your quote mistakes or something you've done do-over. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and another way of saying that, of course, is, and, and this is not original to me, but um, you know, m mistake is a mistake. It was a, it was a, a wrong take. So I'm going to, a yeah. mistake allows you to do it again, a retake. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Becca, I have a question. What do you hmm. believe is a key takeaway you want listeners to get from today's conversation? That there is hope and that you don't have to live in misery and be a slave to your emotions. Yes. Yes. All right. To wrap up the interview, I have a couple of rapid fire questions for you. Okay. What is a quote or motto that you live by? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, what I love is um, what we do when we get together is we, um, we actually put our hands over our heart and we say, I am moving toward an enduring inner stability where nothing disturbs my inner peace. I am moving toward an enduring inner stability where nothing disturbs my inner peace. And I live by those words, as do my students and clients. That is a powerful, would you call that like an affirmation? I would say so. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. What is a book you're and, currently and, 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 and it's and, and it's And it's totally, it's totally secular, you know? Yeah. What is a book you're currently reading or highly recommend that has helped you with this processing of emotions? Well, I never, uh, you know, I'm never far from this book because it's the one that actually started it all for me. And it's called Senses of the Soul. And it is by my mentor, who is Guru Mayor Kalsa. And you can tell that it's really just tattered and torn and there's all sorts of yeah. you know, notes in it. Um, it's, uh, it's what I, it's pivotal in my life. Final question. What advice would you give your younger self? Yeah. You know, we do a, a practice where life is a continuum, you know, um, there, um, where, where younger we're present and then we're our older self and we go to the younger self and, mm -hmm. and commune with them as we go to our older self and commune with them. And what I always told my younger self um, when I held her was that it's going to be okay. Yeah. You're going to uh, live a wonderful, loving, expressive, pain-free life. And, um, and I believe that that's true. And that's what I tell her. That's a powerful message. Becca, thank you so much for today's conversation and joining me. Mm, thank you, Heather. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful.